Ladies and gentlemen, this session, Small Business Leading Detroit's Big Comeback, is hosted by J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Please welcome the Vice President and Program Officer of Global Philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, Tasha Tabron. Good afternoon. I hope that video energized you like it energized me. Yeah? yeah? So today it's an honor and a privilege to um, stand before you today and welcome you to the Small Business Leading Detroit's Comeback Session. I'd like to um, start with giving some, some thank yous to some folks in the room. Um, Kresge Foundation for being our co-host on this session today. Um, and then also to our um, Detroit Regional Chamber for um, giving us the opportunity to highlight our small businesses and our work in this space. And then um, lastly, if I could have my J.P. Morgan Chase colleagues who are in the room, please stand. Uh, John Carter, Jason Tinsley, Neil Graham, <laughs> Shannon Smith, Brad. After this session, I have a feeling that you're going to want to get to know them more, uh, more intimately as you talk more about our investment in um, small businesses. So let me introduce myself. I am officially your hype woman and advocate for small businesses today. And I have one charge, and that's to give you some, um, you know, some, some steps forward on what this session will be about. Um, after I take my seat, you'll be um, uh, presented by four beautiful women who um, will make the case for why the foundation community and the corporate banking community is banking so hard on, um, on small business and why are we investing so um, the, um, heavily on small businesses. It's going to require a little bit of patience on your behalf because this is a very content-rich session. We're going to give you, it's rooted in data, so um, September, Hargrove from our team at J.P. Morgan Chase and Wendy Jackson from the Kresge Foundation is going to spend some moments with you, um, giving you some of the, the data that helps lead to our decisions around investment um, and give you some updates on what people are thinking about the small businesses in the city of Detroit. And then what I'd like to do is um, we'll have all of our folks come up um, from NEI and uh, Walker Miller Services, uh, Energy Services, and um, talk to you a little bit in, the, in an interactive way about what uh, environment the small businesses are, are, are facing right now. So I hope you enjoy this session um, that's content rich and um, it makes good sense for all of us to continue to um, be bullish on Detroit and this session will hopefully um, um, energize you more on why J.P. Morgan Chase is banking on, um, on our small businesses. Thank you so much. Please welcome the Managing Director of the Detroit Program for the Kresge Foundation, Wendy Jackson. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real privilege to be there. It's great here, and it's great to see so many of you. Um, I am extremely privileged to be able to partner with J.P. Morgan Chase and the Chamber and this tremendous panel of magical women that uh, came together to talk about small business uh, development and um, neighborhood revitalization here in the city. So I am going to present um, data, and it's data that is driving uh, at least the decision making within my own institution, the Kresge Foundation, around how we think about small business development, how we invest in small businesses in the city, and um, how we see the connections between small business uh, development and promotion and neighborhood revitalization. Um, and the reason why we undertook this kind of analysis is because um, the factors behind Detroit's recovery are complex, diverse, and multi-layered as the city itself. And so the data that I'm about to share with you um, began with a simple set of questions that our team uh, was trying to answer. Um, first and foremost, we were trying to better understand, do we have a shared perception about what is happening in Detroit as it relates to small business development and economic development? And then the second question that we were trying to um, address was, 
How do we know if what we believe about Detroit's turnaround is perceived the same way? So we started this journey about three years ago um, with what we call the Detroit Reinvestment Index. And those of us who live and work in the city every day and see the momentum that is underway, um, and we see it for sure, but with the Detroit uh, Reinvestment Index, we're really trying to better understand measures of perception about the, the city and its turnaround. And we're trying to glean that um, from three audiences. First and foremost, national business leaders. For the last three years, we have interviewed uh, a cohort of C-suite leaders from around the country about their perceptions of small business development and economic growth here in Detroit. We've also uh, interviewed metro area entrepreneurs and uh, this year we added a new element with a focus on uh, consumers here in the city. And that is again, the newest demographic that we added to this uh, three year data set. Um, this year's data set expands from the overall imp um, impressions of Detroit's rebound to also include consumer attitudes about commercial corridors and community revitalization in the city. So what did we find? First and foremost, the major headline is there's tremendous confidence in Detroit's economic rebound, and it remains very high across the data set for the last three years. Um, this year's index, however, does illuminate a very powerful increase in the three strengths of positive sentiment toward Detroit. The three audiences that we surveyed displayed overwhelming confidence in the city's recovery, as well as Detroit's ability to become uh, a great American city again. And so we saw that confidence play out in the national business leaders. Again, that consistent suite of um, leaders across the country that uh, have been a part of this cohort for the last three years, where 84% of them um, have a high confidence in the turnaround underway. 92% of Detroit entrepreneurs feel similarly, as well as 94% of the residents that we surveyed in the city of Detroit. And a lot of these perceptions are validated by external forces, um, from what folks see in the media to what they experience when they come into the city and more particularly what they experience when they utilize and um, purchase um, from small businesses across Detroit. Our second um, major focus was that the growth of retail activity and small business development is really helping drive um, the perception that it is um, really a good time to think about opening a business here in the city. And so what we found was across the board, Detroiters believe that the retail offerings that we have underway here in the city are better than before, particularly better than 10 years ago, where 79% of uh, consumers across the metro area um, are, are feeling this way and 88% of Detroit entrepreneurs also feel this way. And then particularly of interest to us was those entrepreneurs that felt that they would be very likely to recommend opening a business here in the city. And that has increased tremendously from last year. The third headline that we found in this data was that Detroit residents believe that local small business offerings are essential to neighborhood revitalization in the city. They go hand in hand. In many ways, you can't do one without the other. And as we look at this, um, it breaks out pretty interestingly for us. So 96% um, of consumers, I'm starting in the middle here, really feel that it is important to have a thriving retail district in or near their neighborhood. 
and 93% um, of entrepreneurs agree that uh, small businesses have been at the core of revitalization here in the city. And then another headline for us is around um, commercial corridor funding and how we invest in our commercial corridors. And the fact that we have had a focus, particularly at Kresge, but also among the other philanthropies um, that are investing in the city, um, those investments are really starting to um, come to fruition. As we found with resident feedback, um, the, the feedback has been extremely positive about the kind of commercial corridor investments that we're starting to see. Now, yes, there is a long way to go, but from the uh, investments that have been made, particularly over the last you know, three to four years in the city, um, there's increasing confidence and um, I think a perception that things are starting to, to, to take root and, and turn the corner. And so we looked at this actually across some key commercial corridor um, geographies in Detroit. Obviously there's um, higher levels of perceptions with uh, downtown as well as um, Eastern Market and the Eight Mile Woodward area. But one of the things that we found and we'll be tracking this in um, subsequent uh, uh, surveys is how this plays out in other commercial corridors across the city. Um, from Livernoy McNichols, where I know we all recognize there's a lot of investment underway, all the way to, to West Village. And then the last kind of major headline for us in this research is that commercial corridor investment will definitely alleviate concerns that residents have about safety and the accessibility of retail options. Um, again, this whole issue of vibrancy and the investments that we're making in commercial corridors will have uh, multiplier effects around other issues that we face in neighborhoods. And we see some of this data and how it plays out in more specific responses uh, to that particular headline. So I'm going to stop here and close out, but I wanted to close out by saying that the, one of the reasons why I'm standing here today is because I have a legacy of entrepreneurship in my own family. This is a picture of my grandfather, um, James Kennard, who was an entrepreneur, um, owned a grocery store in Grand Rapids, as well as a window cleaning and janitorial service. And um, from that was able to build a legacy, not only for myself, but uh, that continues with my family going forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this data. And we look forward to the Q&A later on today. Please welcome the Vice President of Global Philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, September Hargrove. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to just thank everyone for, I know you had some options this afternoon to choose in terms of where you would spend your time, your lunch. Um, so we really appreciate that this is a full uh, room this afternoon. Um, and to really just wanna thank um, Tasha for kind of setting the tone following that amazing video um, on small business. And then with Wendy and her presentation around perception of what the data is looking like in terms of Detroit's big comeback and the role that small businesses are playing in that. Um, I love that quote uh, that was included in her slides about build your opportunity. And when you think about a city like Detroit and all that you all have been through in a state like Michigan, um, it's really about building your own opportunity and the future that you want to design for yourself. Um, really it's taking the opportunity to, to figure out what does that look like. And I think this is my first Mackinac and I'm seeing um, the amazing connections that are happening here and how over the course of these few days, I see that opportunity that's being built um, and all the conversations that are happening, the sidebars. Um, so as a compliment to the information that Wendy shared, I wanted to I get this right. Um, talk a little bit about what JPMorgan Chase is doing in terms of our data. Uh, when you think about JPMorgan Chase, 
I'm pretty sure data is not what immediately comes to mind, especially about the role that we've been having in the city of Detroit. Um, but with, through our global philanthropy, we really have determined our strategy based on the data. And so um, as part of our corporate responsibility, we have the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, which is really a global think tank that's been dedicated to delivering data-rich analysis um, and providing insights to help policymakers think differently about the investments that they're making. Um, so this slide kind of captures uh, this wide spectrum of what we're able to accomplish with our data. We provide um, reports that look at our customer spend. Uh, we are able to dig into what they're buying, where they're buying it at, and how frequently. Um, our mission through the work of the Institute really is to help inform decision makers as they're thinking about how to better use the facts, timely data, and thoughtful analysis to drive smarter decision making. Uh, we know that with the limited resources, as you're having to make tough decisions about where to invest and how to invest, that this type of data comes in extremely handy. Um, and I know often when you talk, think about data, you think about the proprietary nature of the data. Um, and so. Um, one of the things that we are very mindful of as we have leveraged the consumer um, commerce data that we've collected through our uh, transactions of our customers to be able to really look at um, how to use that in a way that doesn't um, invade their own privacy. Um, over the next couple of slides, I'm going to really focus in on two types of uh, data that we've captured, one being the local consumer uh, commerce index, which really looks at uh, the car transactions of our customers across the country. We focused in on 14 cities where we've been able to really drill down into what are our customers purchasing, uh, what are the demographics of those customers, where are they buying, at, bu buying it at. Um, so in total, we've been able to analyze over the last 49 months about 60 million kind of transactions that have happened here, or I'm sorry, 24 billion uh, car transactions that have happened. Um, and again, we're able to dissect that information across age, income, business size in terms of are they purchasing at small businesses, are they at medium-sized businesses, what are the products that they're purchasing, um, and where is this transaction happening in um, respect to where they live. So in the lens of looking at this information from the city of Detroit, we are able to capture everything from a regional standpoint. Um, and while we're able to look at the raw transactions down to the zip code level, uh, the data that I will present uh, doesn't necessarily drill down to the zip code, but we are able to look at a comparison of uh, where that resident lives in comparison to where their transactions are taking place. And that allows us to really measure the distance. So in the second half of my presentation, I'll go a little bit into what we're seeing in terms of how far are residents of Detroit having to travel out in order to be able to purchase the goods and services that they need. Specifically looking at the Institute data on spending through the local consumer uh, con uh, index, uh, we're able to see over um, the last uh, 49 months, we're able to kind of, our, unfortunately our data is a little bit of a lag in terms of being able to process, but from January of 17 to January 18, we're able to capture kind of three main highlights at the data. Uh, one, we recognize that consumers that have the lowest income um, have seen the largest spending growth um, increase in the city of Detroit, which is an interesting kind of factoid there. Um, secondly, in January, we saw that there was increased spending at small businesses as well as large businesses. And we'll dig a little bit more into the, the data around how much of an increase that has been happening at small businesses. Um, and lastly, I think this uh, point ties very nicely into the presentation that Wendy gave in terms of perception of how well our business is doing is that small business uh, or spending at small businesses within the same neighborhoods as where the residents lives has really seen an increase um, over the last year. So if you look at the bottom section of this slide, uh, we kind of have some breakdowns that I just want to highlight. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail over the next couple of slides. But who's doing all this spending? Where are these increases happening? And we're really seeing that with millennials um, throughout the city of Detroit that are really kind of seeing the greatest growth in their spending. It's about 17%. Um, and then also within uh, income uh, quartiles, we're seeing that uh, low income residents have been increasing their spending power. Um, in terms of where that's is happening, again, it's in the same neighborhood that they are living. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to highlight here 
is with specifically with small businesses, it's, it's much higher at uh, small businesses versus the larger businesses, about 2.9% increase over the last year that spending is taking place. So this chart here kind of gives us a breakdown from 2014 to January 2018 in terms of what does that average look like. So you definitely there are peak months where we're seeing spending going up significantly and where we see a little bit of a drop. But overall, if we were able to kind of analyze over the last uh, couple of years, the overall spending increase has been 0.2 and you can kind of track that over the time horizon. Um, an interesting thing that we've seen here with this chart is that Detroit has stayed on pace and in some cases exceeded uh, national spending trends. So that's a, a huge um, value in terms of looking at the perceptions that uh, Wendy presented on in terms of how well is Detroit doing overall. Again, I want to come back to um, the role that millennials are playing in the spending increases that are happening across the city. Um, the green line demonstrates the audience that's under the age of 35, um, followed by the blue line is kind of that middle group, the 35 to 45 or 54, and then um, our more wiser established uh, residents um, are that orange line down there at the bottom. And if you look, there's a significant gap that's taking place between millennials and the next um, age grouping there if you're looking at the 2018 data. So really as you all are thinking about, you know, neighborhood revitalization and uh, small businesses and where should we be locating uh, retail options and services, recognizing that this is an audience that definitely has the spending power um, and as you're thinking about how do we accommodate for these groups within um, our neighborhoods. And lastly, wanted to come back to revisit um, the specific spin that we're seeing that's happening at small businesses. Um, I really want to highlight, if you look at the far left of the chart back in 2014, the blue line represents small business spend. Um, there was a significant time where this was a huge gap between what was happening at our small businesses as well in comparison to our medium and large size businesses. Um, but if you look in 2018, there's been this steady growth that's happening uh, with small businesses. As we think about the continual resources that we need to invest in small businesses over the long term, um, we see that it's starting to pay dividends. So to switch gears for just a little bit, um, want to drill down specifically into what we're seeing when it comes to retail. Back in March of 2017, the Institute put together this report called Going the Distance that really looked at specifically what was happening in the neighborhoods in terms of access to retail options, goods and services for residents. Um, how far are folks having to travel? What are they having to travel out to buy? Um, and looking at how do we take this information to help better inform policy decisions around neighborhood revitalization. I'm sure you all are familiar with the concept of the 20 minute neighborhood as a response to how do we improve access to services within a neighborhood. And so this report really looks at, while that is a good solution for how to solve for some of the challenges, that it's not necessarily a one size fit all approach uh, for how to address the, the retail needs that are happening um, in our neighborhoods. Specifically, this report looked at Detroit as well as New York. And while these two cities couldn't be further apart from each other, they did provide an interesting perspective in terms of the history of New York as being a very densely populated area um, in comparison to uh, Detroit where we've seen more around kind of single family homes. Um, but looking at the gaps that are happening, um, in the Detroit map, you'll see the darker blue areas show the neighborhoods that have the furthest uh, that they need to travel in order to access goods and services in terms of retail options in comparison to New York. There are fewer neighborhoods that are darker, um, but you'll see um, here in the Detroit map that the downtown area is definitely the lighter area, but as you get further out, uh, the distance that residents are having to travel are upwards of three and four miles to be able to get the goods and services that they need. The upside of this, however, is that we're starting to see as a result is that over time we're making progress. Um, if you look at the 2016 uh, bar graph there, um, we've started to see on average that the distance that individuals are having to travel is declining. Um, it's about 3% of a change that we've seen there. 
And with this, we're seeing overall, in terms of a, the longer process or of evaluation, about 1.1 distance miles that have shifted. Um, but this second graph here shows a little bit better of the percentage change for low-income residents. Unfortunately, they're having to travel much further than um, more wealthier residents in the city. On average, it's about 2.1 miles that they're having to travel um, in order to get the services that they need. However, over time, this number has started to decrease, which is a good sign, but it, thinks, it continues to demonstrate uh, that there's still more work to do. And for this slide here, we were able to take a look at, through this report, um, what exactly are folks having to travel out to purchase? We were able to put all of the uh, options, of the retail options, into kind of seven key categories. And we're seeing that when it comes to grocery stores and pharmacies, the distance that individuals are having to travel is significantly lower, but there's still a ways to go in order to improve access when it comes to things like clothing and entertainment and restaurants. And I know that um, in several of the other research studies that have been done, especially with DEGC and their recent retail study, looking at how do you start to diversify the mix of retail options that are in a neighborhood and kind of looking at what really are the desires of residents and how do you start to diversify those options in a neighborhood. So looking at this slide here, we're starting to kind of, again, it's a, a recap of the overall distance that folks are having to travel and seeing these shifts starting to change, again, with um, low-income residents having to travel the furthest and higher-income residents uh, being able to access these goods more easier. So again, this is looking at kind of comparison to durable versus non-durable goods. We're seeing that there is a major kind of gap that still needs to be filled when you're looking at access um, to non-durable goods. It's increased, but there's still work to go. Um, in conclusion for this particular slide of this data, we're getting ready to transition into a discussion where we'll have a kind of reactionary panel to the information that's been presented, wanting to just really highlight some of the things that have come out of uh, this particular set of data is when you're looking at the time that individuals are spending to be able to travel to uh, access these goods, that that takes a lot away from what else they're able to spend their time and their resources on. So as we're starting to think about neighborhood revitalization, like what are the goods and services, the mix that need to happen in the neighborhoods? Uh, while we've seen gains, I think we can agree that there's a lot that still needs to be done. Um, and how can you start to be more thoughtful about the mix of resources that are going into uh, a neighborhood when you're thinking about small business? So that concludes my data. Thank you for sitting through that. I know it was kind of dense, especially having the two presentations back to back. Uh, but now we'll go ahead and transition to the discussion. Joining September Hargrove on stage is Managing Director of the Detroit Program for the Kresge Foundation, Wendy Jackson. <laughs> Director for the New Economy Initiative, Pamela Lewis. President and Chief Executive Officer for Walker Miller Energy Services, Carla Walker Miller. So in my second hat that I'm playing today, I'm playing moderator. <laughs> so um, first hat, Data Institute, second hat, moderator. Um, Pam, I want to, to highlight that video, which was amazing. Um, but before we drill a little bit into that, let's take it a step back. And I want to go to Wendy first. Mm -hmm. um, looking at our two presentations, you talked a lot about the perceptions, what people are thinking both inside of Detroit as well as outside of the, the city on how well is the, revi the recovery going. Um, and then looking at the data that I presented specifically on where people are spending, what they're spending it on, I would love just kind of re your reaction mm -hmm. to the comparisons between the two uh, sets of information that we shared. Sure, well first and foremost, thank you everyone to sit through two data presentations, yes. we really, but it is such rich information. And um, you know, one of the, my reaction um, was, well of course, just enthusiastic. I think if we are able to kind of capture the spend, you know, I was just blown away by the credit card transaction data, um, for example, and so if we're able to, think about how we capture that spend, capitalize on it, and grow it, 
in a strategic way in our commercial on our commercial corridors and, in, and within our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. I think we have tremendous potential. And it's all about how do we get this mix right? Yeah. And um, and so I think you know thinking about what Pam is doing with NEI Ideas, what DEGC is doing with mm -hmm. Motor City Match, and how we might want to think about being even more intentional, particularly based on the data that DEGC has captured. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think there are great possibilities for how we can even amplify what we've already been doing in commercial corridor and neighborhood revitalization investment. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that optimism is definitely a great takeaway for today in terms of how we're thinking about what's happening on those quarters, what's happening with small businesses, and what's happening with the spin there. Um, Pam, I would love to follow up with you specifically on kind of looking at the data. How is that? That must be validating to the work that you're doing with NEI. I would love just for you to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what do we see in that video? What is that all about? Um, what is the, the work that you're doing to build out the ecosystem? And how does this data kind of validate the work that you're doing? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And I count myself a data geek, and that was a lot. Uh, very <laughs> rich and dense and very informative. So the video you saw actually um, is NEI's tribute to small businesses. We have a small business competition that's very accessible that we call any ideas where we basically give anywhere from 260 to half million dollars away to 20 to 30 businesses within Detroit, Hamtramck and Highland Park. And we do that not to give away the grants. These are grants to for-profit businesses, but we do that so that we can identify the thousands of businesses that are applying so we can appoint them to the resources that have been funded through NEI and others that are helping businesses across the city. And so just to back up, um, NEI, any ideas is really just a small thread of what NEI is about. It was formed 10 years ago um, by foundations, uh, foundation roll call, a lot of them are in the room, <laughs> uh, Kellogg and Knight, Ford, Kresge, did I cover everybody? Hudson Weber, Community Foundation and others, and you got Kresge, me. I got it. <laughs> um, but they had the foresight to say, what could philanthropy do to help the economy? You have to think about what was happening 10 years ago, which is when NEI started. And what was happening is this was a, a community that was very reliant on a single sector, the automotive industry, a community that had experienced a lot of job loss. Um, education attainment was not, is not as, still is not as high as it should be. And how do we reinvigorate a culture of entrepreneurship? to really create alternative paths to job creation and financial stability, mm -hmm. and do it in a way that if you have the idea and will, there's an access of support to help you. We give you access to, to, to help you. So we've been making, we're basically grant makers. We've been making grants to programs like Build Institute, Michigan Women's Foundation, Tech Town, Global Detroit, Design Corps, and all these people that are, basically see themselves as a system of support so that if you wanna start a business, no matter your zip code, your educational background, um, your race, your gender, it doesn't matter. There's an access of support to help you. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've made, I think about 110 million in grants. 60% of that has fallen within the city of Detroit. And uh, we've seen about 9,500 businesses that have received help mm -hmm. over those 10 years, about 3,000 that have started. Mm -hmm. And what's been most fascinating is over 40% have been founded by people of color and then about a third of them by women. And so we're really excited about that data. Wonderful. We have some data too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna turn to Carla, because you represent that demographic. You're Absolutely. a woman of color who started a business. You're building your own energy empire uh, with the Walker Miller Energy <laughs> Services. So I'm curious in terms of, one, what's your reaction to the data, looking at the spending growth that's happening? You know, are you, do you feel that with your business? Uh, I absolutely feel that with my business, and I feel the, the hope and the optimism and uh, even the, the joy, to be honest, that there is finally investment, there are finally resources here. And our business philosophy is strongly based on our belief in the city of Detroit. We have a goal to have 70% uh, Detroiters in our company by 2020. We track and we're at 58% right now, which is the highest we've ever been. But, uh, but my point is, and what I really love about that video is the rich diversity of Detroit. The fact that the perception of what an entrepreneur looks like mm -hmm. needs to change, because one of the barriers I feel 
for entrepreneurs is that there's still this idea that uh, young white men are entrepreneurs, where in fact, the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the country right now is black females, women of color. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of that fact because we have a lot of catching up to do. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so, uh, but we really need to acknowledge that and provide the supports that, um, that those statistics generate because we are nurturers, we are making a difference in the city, and we were holding it down when other people were just writing about what was going on in Detroit, so. So that's interesting. Um, I actually wanna follow up on something that you said in terms of holding it down. Like, you are trailblazing and you're leading away, but take us back a little bit. why did you start your business? Like, what, led, what, motiva <laughs> what was the motivating factor? Because I did a little bit of research on you, and this wasn't necessarily an area that you first started in, in terms of uh, energy services. No, no, I did uh, 18 years in corporate America, and I mean, I did 18 years. <laughs> 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 and uh, there was no path for me. I went as far as I could go as quickly as I could. Mm -hmm. And I started a business with uh, large power equipment, and when the bottom fell out, then I switched courses. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, around uh, 2014, the, entre the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem really started to change and grow. So the foundations that are represented here, the CDFIs that are here, they really have um, facilitated my success. And uh, just a shout out about that video, I, Pam was sitting next to me and she yeah. saw that I actually got choked up because it's an acknowledgement of how brutal a path to profit can be, mm. or not, not can be, is, is for most mm. small businesses. It was an acknowledgement of the fact that we are struggling and part of, the, part of what small businesses have to do is we have to fake it until we make it, but there's <laughs> so much pain in the entrepreneurial community right now mm -hmm. because the struggle is so very real for so very long. So that was an incredible video. No, I agree. Um, and I'm really glad that we were able to, to bring it to uh, this group to really kind of breathe life into this very data rich uh, presentation. <laughs> yeah. And if I could add, one of the reasons why, because NEI, you know, we focus on all types of entrepreneurship from innovation led to high tech growth to small business. But to Carla's point, one of the things that we found is how do we need to redefine what it means to be an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, entrepreneurship has been had. A lot of times entrepreneurship comes because it's, you know, necessities of mother's invention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we t too often celebrate the startup tech culture, which should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're excited about that too. But we don't want to dismiss the existing small businesses that have been, you know, working really hard. Uh, in the neighborhood. So we call, you know, we have startups and we have bin ups, right? And we want, and, we want, and, and backups. And backups. <laughs> that almost failed during the recession. Way up. The recession so we want to make sure that. That was a that tweetable moment. <laughs> That's right. Startups, <laughs> bin ups, and backups. But the value, the value needs to go across all of them. Yeah. Um, that actually is a nice segue into something that I wanted to, to talk about specifically, like what are the resources that have been created in Detroit to really support these existing big businesses, the, the legacies, the, the bin ups and the backups? Um, and I think this is a question for, for Wendy. Um, we've had the pleasure of working together, like our organizations, Kresge and JP Morgan Chase. Um, and just this last year, we came together to uh, support the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. It's something that we had previously launched two years ago with the Kellogg Foundation, um, but we were looking to increase that. And we thank you to your support, Fifth Third and the Ralph Wilson, um, we were able to grow the size of that fund to 18 million. But this is not typically something that your organization has the type of work that you guys do to support um, through your philanthropic in investment. So I'm curious, you know, what motivated you all to, to get involved with this fund? Um, and what do you think about the types of programs that are existing out there to drive uh, supports for entrepreneurs and to build that confidence that we're seeing that came through in your survey? Well, the power of collaboration is real, particularly among philanthropy. And for Kresge, we've had to kind of go outside of our comfort zone now for the last decade because <laughs> of you know, the economic downturn and everything that has happened. Um, in the city and really in the country to cities. But, you know, the real reason is actually the gentleman sitting over to my right, Ed <laughs> Ignatius, um, when he came in to talk to us about it, oh, I don't know, Ed, four years ago? And you know, at that point, we weren't ready, but um, 
you know, as I shared in my presentation, uh, entrepreneurship is in my DNA. And I knew, I started thinking in that presentation how we would at one point be able to come in and be of support. Um, and so it just really builds off of kind of the commitment that we saw mm -hmm. with uh, Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, Kellogg, and the other funders that are involved in the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. It builds off of our work with NEI, with DEGC. You know, again, trying to create this entrepreneurial ecosystem that cuts across whether you're starting out or have already been in place in the city trying to make your, your businesses work. Great. So access to capital is one of the, the things that we've worked on collaboratively, I think everyone across the, mm -hmm. on this panel. Um, and I'm curious uh, for Carla, you know, as a business that's existing, you know, what are some of the resources that are available or maybe that are missing mm -hmm. that you think could really go to, to help more businesses like yours um, sur to survive in the way in which you had? And, and I wanted to point out that you made it through the mm -hmm. recession, the economic yes. downturn. Um, I'm just curious about, you know, how were you able to tap into the ecosystem, especially during that time, to really um, to drive your business forward? During that time, I, I keep referring to 2014 because it really was like a, a coming out. I don't know how many of you all have seen The Wiz, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the period where things really start to change and people start embracing that change, to me, started in about 2014. And I was fortunate because I went through um, Goldman Sachs, 10,000 small businesses, and really pursued business I would no, not normally have pursued. Yeah. And um, only because I knew that the money was coming. Training has always been a part of the ecosystem. In 08, 9, 10, we could always be trained out the wazoo. Mm -hmm. The secret <laughs> is what do you do with all that training when you don't have access to capital and you don't have a, a real market? So the timing, uh, just the convergence of the market, the timing, mm -hmm. and I was able to borrow enough money to keep our business going through literally six months of performing a contract before we were able to get, before we got paid under that contract. Businesses I would never have pursued at that time uh, or, or ever. So the fact that the ecosystem is so rich, to me mm -hmm. the biggest challenge is helping people to believe that all the opportunities that are here right now really are here, mm -hmm. and that people in the neighborhoods actually have access. Uh, you know, it's almost like, come get it, guys. It really is here, and there aren't strings. You know, we are, uh, we finally have an opportunity to do big things in a big way. Can, can I jump no, in? Absolutely. Here? Because I was thinking about this, because uh, we always talk about this network of support, and what does that really mean? And, who are all the programs, and I think one of the best ways, when I think of Carla and I think of other entrepreneurs, I think of uh, Erica Boyd and Kirsten Usury, and whoever's from Detroit probably know who these women are. They own Detroit Vegan Soul. And so if you follow the track of that company from two women that were catering, creating very delicious soul food, mm -hmm. I like meat, this is, but this is vegan soul food, it's very <laughs> good, um, in their basement, to being able to employ 40 people in two different locations in less than 60 months. So how did that happen, right? You have, they started at Build Institute, you know, uh, April's right there, they, they started at Build Institute. They got a micro loan from Detroit Development Fund. They work with Grandma Rosedale and the people in West Village to get their locations squared away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want any ideas. And, and Erica and Kirsten would have been, well, they were gonna be successful anyway. Yeah. because of who they are. But how did that ecosystem accelerate their success? Mm -hmm. And how did it give them an opportunity to grow to 40 employees, mm -hmm. 40 employees that are predominantly Detroiters that are in, in, in restaurants that are in neighborhoods mm -hmm. that people from the neighborhoods can go to, with, which adds to the, the data Absolutely. that you guys shared, is a perfect example of how the ecosystem works. You know, and there's, a, there's, there's more. but. Uh, Benkari Engineering is another one mm -hmm. um, where Adrian Bennett, right? And she's a master plumber, one of the first African American master mm -hmm. plumbers in the country. The, I'm sorry, the first. The, the first. first. <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, and she uh, won any idea. She won ten thousand dollar any ideas mm -hmm. challenge, where you had to be making less than seven hundred thousand dollars a year in order to apply for that one. Um, and within two years, the, the, the equipment she was able to purchase from that $10,000 grant 
put her in position to get contracts with the Little Caesars and others, and now she's way out of that category. She's mm -hmm. making well over, you know, much more than that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and employing more people, yeah. again, she, you know, DEGC, D to D procurement program. I mean, these are the different resources that are out there, and the point is, I always think about it is, you know, a lot of us that are here at Mackinac, I'm sure our kids have a network they can tap into, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's people that we know, there's opportunities we can provide them. What this network of support is doing for entrepreneurs independent of their zip code is giving them a network of support that they can tap into independent of who they know. And so that's what's really important. And I think that's one of the things that came through the data that was really telling was mm -hmm. that neighborhood businesses based in the neighborhoods are succeeding. Yeah. I think there's a lot of perception around you have to be downtown. That that's where the business is, that when you think about Detroit, that outside of downtown things are kind of, you know, it's a little sketch. But the reality is that we're seeing with the data and as you're driving around that neighborhoods are coming back and that these businesses in the neighborhoods could be just as successful as their counterparts happening downtown. Um, Pam and Wendy, I would love just to kind of hear a little bit more about, um, as it relates to growing retail offerings in the city from a place-based strategy, what could we be doing more? Mm. Well, I think about, particularly in your data, those top two tiers, clothing and entertainment, and how do we kind of build off of the data that the DEGC is collecting to think about, again, being more intentional mm -hmm. about the kinds of businesses that could address uh, those two areas in the city. Um, because, you know, I live in Detroit, just thinking about my own buying habits, um, which aren't quite millennial, but, <laughs> you know, some days are pretty close. <laughs> um, um, but what can, you know, Still, there are some challenges of getting access to the kinds of goods and services that um, we all know and want to see in our neighborhoods. Um, and so I think focusing on the areas where there are gaps and thinking about the programs that we have in the ecosystem and how they can start to address those gaps more intentionally is one way mm -hmm. to start to go at it. Yeah, some of the gaps that we're seeing, particularly when it, it comes to flexible and affordable space, um, and what's happening, you know, what's the support that's happening in Midtown and how do you expand that to the neighborhoods? I think Motor City Match, Motor City mm -hmm. Restore has done a good job at getting at that. We have, uh, we learned early on that we couldn't really do justice in supporting neighborhood businesses without developing relationships with those that have trusted relationships with neighborhood businesses. And so we support a lot of the CDCs mm -hmm. and the role that they play in the neighborhood to be a concierge to provide accessible space. I met Sylvester Hester just this afternoon who's, you know, has his business and, and offering flexible, affordable space mm. to entrepreneurs on Clark Street. Um, there's a lot of that going on. And we're also finding with, with entrepreneurs that are actually makers, you know, um, uh, Eric Yelsma, Detroit Denim, or, mm. you know, uh, Gwen Jameer, Naturalicious Hair Products, Melissa Butler, Lip Bar, they need spaces to be able to manufacture their products. Mm -hmm. And then flexible, affordable space is the first challenge. And the second one is getting talent that can help fill the jobs that they have. So those are the two gaps that we're finding. Absolutely. If I can make two quick points. One is that uh, there's a data science na scientist named Brian McKinney who did some research and said that for African-American businesses, for every 100 people they hire, they hire 65 African-Americans. For every 100 people that a majority business hires, they hire 10. What that means is that investment in businesses, in local businesses, pays dividends in those particular communities. So, mm -hmm. and I, buying a building in Detroit, a lot of people say we are investing in Detroit because we're buying a building. Buying a building is an investment in yourself at this point because Detroit's buildings are going to sell because they're good investments. If you want to invest in Detroit, I ask the corporate community to invest in the people mm -hmm. of Detroit, hire the people of Detroit mm -hmm. who are incredible. My, the reason that we have a 70% go is to set an example and prove that you can be successful. You can be a totally bad ass company, mm -hmm. totally sourced from Detroit. You can get everything you need by investing in the people in Detroit. Mm -hmm.
I feel like that was a mic drop moment. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like I wish we could stop there, but we've got a little bit more time. <laughs> but you touched on something that's very interesting in terms of the uh, another return on investment from supporting neighborhood businesses is not only do you start to see a transition in the neighborhood in terms of access to the goods and services that they need, but it's a source of jobs. Mm -hmm. You've done an amazing job in terms of building that into the philosophy of your business. Mm -hmm. What do you think is standing between other businesses, majority-based businesses, to make the disconnect for, like how do we encourage them to think about bringing this into their, their business philosophy? Um, and I think this goes ties into the, the broader conversations that are happening here at Mackinac around equity. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd love to say, if you were to, to talk to your peer group of uh, CEOs, you know, how would you encourage them to think differently about local hiring? Well, the, the conversations on equity are, are real and they're relevant, but the real conversation is profit, that diverse organizations are more profitable organizations. Mm -hmm. And for majority organizations, hiring Detroiters will diversify your organizations because we go into buildings every day in downtown and the offices look like the suburbs because the people are coming in and they're working in Detroit and they're taking the money back out of the city. So the fact that you would hire people from Detroit who understand things that you don't understand, that you have diversity of information, diversity of opinion and thought, mm -hmm. is the real argument for hiring Detroiters. Yeah. I definitely agree. Um, so let's start, let me check the time, all right. Um, I want to stay on this topic of kind of equity and inclusion. Um, and would love to, to kick it over to Pam and to Wendy to think about how do we start to, through our organizations with philanthropy, integrate that into our practices when we are doing investments that are focusing on supporting small businesses and community development? Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, that, so inclusion has been at the heart of NEI from the very beginning, and, and there are a couple of ways that we came at it. First of all, it was in the way that we made our grants and the conversations we had with our grantees. Mm -hmm. Uh, we encourage them and socialize this whole concept of, we know that your doors are open to anyone, but people may not feel comfortable coming through them. Mm -hmm. So what might you do differently? And then when you start to see Tech Town now going out into the neighborhood, mm -hmm. or you know Michigan Women's Foundation having a micro-lending program for minority women within the city of Detroit, mm -hmm. or BUILD having nine different classes across the city, or any ideas working with Global Detroit to create all the materials in five different languages. That is an intentional statement around inclusion. Mm -hmm. And then we tracked the numbers. You know, who are you talking to? Who are you helping? What do they look like? The other thing we started to do is encourage our grantees to consider when that job opens up, who are you hiring next? Mm -hmm. And it's been nice to see that those that are supporting entrepreneurs, that picture has actually diversified also. Um, and then one of the other things that we're, we are, um, one of the nuts we're still trying to crack though has to do with when you're talking about small business, it has been easier to talk about inclusion. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about high tech and growth, it has been much more difficult. And so we still are challenged with trying to make the case of minority and women owned businesses that are innovation led businesses and tech businesses and high growth businesses are also worth investing in for those same reasons. Mm -hmm. And so we've been trying to work hard to build that access to capital, access to what I call the big capital, mm -hmm. <laughs> and access to the global markets, uh, making sure that that gets in place for, for minorities and women as well. Our experience at Kresge has been, in, been similar in terms of you know, looking at how we are doing with our grantees and, and uh, grantee partners. But I will say, uh, we've also focused more on ourselves as an organization and particularly within our Detroit program. And how do we lead with a racial equity lens? Um, how do we uh, change the way we think about access to capital to make sure that we're investing in the best way to ensure uh, outcomes that promote inclusion and equity? And I think what's, what's really fascinating that I've seen is when you support minority and women entrepreneurs, the values that come with that mm -hmm. are sometimes different mm -hmm. than what you typically see. So for example, I mean, yeah. you have very intentional, you wanna hire Detroiters, you know, you talk to 
Uh, there's a gentleman named Belief Edamero who has a pharmacy in the Osborne neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't just offer a pharmacy, he actually has an apprentice program so that young people can learn how to be pharmacists in his store. He has copying services and he has a payment plan so that people in his neighborhood, they don't have to wait to get their monthly check in order to buy their product. Mm -hmm. They can get their prescription whenever they need it and settle up later because he understands the needs of that community. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Hines, who's working on sickle cell innovation in a space that no one has cared about sickle cell for decades, right? Um, but it's a disease that affects minorities. And so this is why you know, these big societal issues, uh, but we also have to be careful that it's not one or the other. We want all, everyone to be supported. Uh, we don't care what color you are or what gender you are. We don't care if you're a hipster or a millennial <laughs> or a baby boomer. I was glad I almost barely made it in that middle group. Um, we want everybody to, to, be, to be successful, but there is something that unique that comes with supporting women and minority entrepreneurs in terms of how they see themselves in the community mm -hmm. um, and what they want to give back to it. It's been fascinating to watch. Um, so this red light has been blinking at us oh, for a few minutes now. Hello. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and start to conclude the conversation, um, but I really just wanted to, in your final kind of remarks, just highlighting the, the value of having Carla on this panel to really demonstrate, as you're saying, the intentionality that comes with having, uh, supporting women and entrepreneurs of color, the different approach that they are taking to thinking about hiring, where they're play, like who they're working with, I think is tremendous. So in bringing it, tying it all together in terms of you know small business leading Detroit's big comeback, um, I think some of the takeaways here is that you know, investing in place matters. Mm -hmm. um, that small businesses serve not only as a resource for goods and services, but it's jobs, it's community building, it's kind of that institution that helps to serve as a resource beyond just what you're able to purchase there. Um, it's like a beacon of hope in terms of, you know, being that first business to, to land in that intersection, knowing that it's gonna help be a catalyst um, in that neighborhood. So um, definitely wanna make sure that the group walks away with that, see that the, spending that's happening in small businesses is increasing. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of room to go in terms of bridging that gap in terms of access. Um, but when you're thinking about the future of Detroit and the future of Detroit's neighborhoods, small businesses are playing a tremendous role in the future that we will have. So uh, we'll go ahead and end on that note. Definitely appreciate everyone's time uh, this afternoon listening in on our session. I would love to give this amazing panel a round of applause. Yeah.